Okay, so temple's destroyed, and uh, then 132 to 35 of the Common Era is the Bar Kokhba revolt. And the Bar Kokhba revolt, the, the end results was far worse uh, for the Jewish community in, of the land of Israel. In terms of exile, uh, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. Uh, it's got totally, it's plowed under, it's become uh, Jews are not allowed there. It's renamed Ilya Kaptolona. Capitolina, I think it is. It's been a while for my Latin. Capitolina. Uh, we have the Jewish communities have already begun the process of expanding around the Mediterranean basin. We know there were still Jews in uh, Mesopotamia, Iraq, uh, Iran, in that area, of course, which we referred to as Babylonian Jewish tradition. The Babylonian Talmud comes from there. Uh, and it's completed around the year, well, various dates given, 450, 500 of the common era, somewhere in that neighborhood, more or less, although we know, as I explained when we talked about rabbinic literature, that it took a while for it really to be finished. And the more that modern scholars uh, look at the history of the text, they can see that scribe, scribes were not always careful to copy down exactly what they were supposed to be copying. You know, uh, I don't know, when I was a kid, we had teachers that put notes on the board and we would have to write down on you know, the old days. You know, we, we, I even remember using a slide rule. Uh, anybody know what a slide rule is? Okay, another, another old man like me. All right. So, uh, you know, and so there are certain rules that are known about transcribing something that people sometimes skip a word because the the sound alike almost or they they start with the same letter. Sometimes they'll go to the next line because of the same letter or the same word. But also we know that copyists sometimes put in remarks to clear clarify, make it clearer to whoever is reading it, even though their clarification might make it wrong. Uh, uh, so and uh, so the text that we have of the Talmud today uh, really wasn't finished then, uh, and any modern text of the Talmud we that you look at today uh, has undergone that scribal transmission. It underwent uh, church censorship. Uh, any passage that makes mention of a figure by the name of Yeshu. Uh, was excised from the text because they assumed it meant Jesus. <laughs> Although it's probably clear, according to at least some scholarly views, that none of them are referring to Jesus of Nazareth. But those were censored. Other books were censored as well throughout the course of time, uh, even to such an extent in, uh, there was a work called the Aruch HaShulchan, which was a legal work that was done in, around the turn of the 20th, beginning of the 20th century. And he has nothing on conversion because it was just not allowed in Russia. He says, we don't do it today. So he leaves, omits all of that section. In other books, he had to have the stamp of the censor on the book to get it published. So censorship, clumsy copyists, people uh, explaining things, adding so it's it was until the printing press came along and, and kind of made a final judgment. But even now, scholars look back and look at manuscripts. And the other day, I was learning with somebody a text, and my copy of the Talmud, it was a recently printed copy of the Talmud. There was a mistake. A clear mistake was in it. It happens. You know, to read some of the stuff that's in newspapers, right? Sometimes editors miss something. All right. So we talked about that. We talked about uh, the, the continuation of rabbinic Judaism. Uh, in a sense, we have rabbis replacing priests, although I, I, this is my note here, but I, in not, this, not in the same way that the priests function, but the rabbis as leaders, as teachers, uh, as uh, more than functionaries. Uh, prayer, of course, replaced uh, sacrificial worship. Uh, and so, uh, okay, I, you know, I lean pair. All right, almost there. It's just, okay, almost is only good in horseshoes. All right. Uh, so, 
when we uh, begin what is be generally considered to be the medieval period, the Middle Ages, depends on how far back you want to push it, um, Jewish life in general uh, had a certain degree of deterioration under Roman rule. The Roman Empire itself was was growing weaker, uh, and uh, Christianity was beginning to thrive uh, and expand throughout uh, the Mediterranean basin. Uh, and um, as one author suggests, uh, Jewish life in the Middle Ages uh, is characterized by two major changes, uh, which is important. Virtually all Jews now lived outside the land of Israel, and they lived under either Christian and a little bit later Islamic rule. That part of the world, for the most part, Jews lived in areas that were Christian or soon to become Muslim. Uh, there is there's a report that suggests that up to 10% of the Roman Empire at one time around the early parts of the first few centuries may have been Jewish, spread around the, the Mediterranean basin. Uh, but a lot of those uh, were people who had converted to Judaism, are, are people who were interested in Judaism but hadn't made an actual conversion. And when Christianity came along, and, and for various reasons, they drifted into the Christian camp. And so uh, that put a, a, a damper on the, the Jewish growth. Uh, and Jews had to learn to live in many cases with being second-class citizens at best in many of the lands in which they lived. Uh, now, Christianity, in part to distinguish itself uh, from Judaism, uh, if you've ever learned anything about the early church history, there was debates. So what did a Christian have to do to be a Christian? Did they have to be a Jew, in essence, to be a Christian? Well, that would have been a big problem. So that no longer really came the case. And so they limited those things that you had to do. Circumcision was eliminated. Kashrut was eliminated. Uh, and uh, I don't recall offhand the, the things that they said, but it was just a handful of basic uh, ritual rules, uh, not to eat strike something was strangled. I don't know why that came in. Uh, but uh, they clearly decided to differentiate themselves from Judaism with the fall of when the temples destroyed, uh, uh, the early Christians who were in, in Jerusalem had fled. When the Bar Kokhba revolt came out, some of the rabbinic leadership saw Bar Kokhba as being the Messiah, the Mashiach. And in Christian circles, Jesus had already become, in their mind, whatever else they thought of Jesus, he was the Messiah. So that clearly made a, a gap between the two camps. Uh, at a certain stage in uh, uh, the development of Jewish prayer, I, I think I mentioned it, uh, a prayer was introduced into the synagogue service uh, that condemned heretics. That's one of the prayers that were uh, censored, edited during the medieval, late mid Middle Ages to remove some of that the language that is there. You originally was something al mini malti tikva kol risha egatoved or chutz adon the for sectarians for the evil kingdom, which is a reference to the uh, Rome and later on to the Catholic Church, which replaced the Roman Empire, uh, which was very negative. So the Jews were also trying to push Christians out of the synagogue, and Christians are all too happy to distinguish themselves from Jews, right? And so by the time uh, when uh, Constantine comes along and, and makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, you can see how the path to discrimination against Jews is, is on its way. Uh, 
because Jews rejected Jesus, they had to be on a second-class basis, right? because by their very foundation of, of not recognizing uh, him uh, made uh, it necessary to distinguish Jews from good Christians, efforts to separate as much as possible. There are uh, prohibitions at different times against Jews owning land. Uh, we do know that even in the 10th century, 11th, 10th, 11th century, I was just reading a text the other day in which it was a woman who was a landowner and there's an argument over, over taxes. That's how sometimes you find out history. You look at the rabbinic literature and there was a question, can this, how can they tax this land? Do they tax it the same way they tax merchandise all right, in the Jewish community to raise taxes to pay the king? Because the community was taxed. That's another thing. The Jews lived in, in medieval Europe as a community, not as individuals. Right? Uh, and taxes were imposed on the Jewish community. Then internally, the Jewish community could decide how to, to divvy up the taxes. But that was a, an important element. This communal existence was something when we come to the modern era and we come to the French Revolution was extremely important because one of the things that happens in the 19th century uh, with liberalization of various kinds of went back and forth, depending upon who's in charge at the time, uh, Jews were going to be, were admitted as citizens of the countries in which they resided, but as individuals. It was the individual Jew, not the Jewish community. The communal existence was pushed aside for good or good and bad. Uh, in uh, iconog iconography, you will see uh, pictures of the church victorious on some uh, medieval churches, you know, like Notre Dame and these uh, fancy cathedrals. And then, uh, then it would be uh, Judaism would be represented by a, a, a figure that was downtrodden, mm -hmm. or uh, in some horrible images, suck uh, of a pig with with uh, pe uh, Jews sucking at the tits of the the fish, of the sow. All right. Uh, so church versus the synagogue, this iconography was part of their way of seeing the world. And that's going to, going to be reflected in, as I said, uh, narrowing what Jews could do in the economy, uh, eliminating them from owning land and eventually, uh, eliminating from many trades, eventually, uh, uh, as time went by, uh, to... Uh, uh, being met, basically left with lending money uh, as one of the uh, pawning pawnbrokers and that sort of thing uh, that we are, we associate often with Jews in the later era. Uh, so now, all right, so I mentioned uh, in 330, the Roman Emperor Constantine made Constantinople, which is in modern Turkey, a second capital of the Roman Empire. And Constantine also gave Christianity preferred status. And uh, so that was the beginning of the establishment of the, of the church as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, and a bit earlier, five years earlier, in a, uh, a council in Nicaea, uh, which was uh, attended by approximately 300 bishops, uh, established Christian doctrine, including the Trinity. Right. And so Christianity aimed to distinguish itself from its Jewish roots and officially establish the dating of Easter as independent of Pesach. This year is one of the unusual times when Pesach and Easter don't coincide. Right. But if I know, if I remember correctly, the Orthodox Church will celebrate Easter around Passover time. Right. Uh, So uh, we have a growing pressure on Jewish communities 
but this is really exhibited in the mid sixth uh, century. Uh, when you read the history of Europe and of Rome, uh, there are all these goths, not the modern goths of uh, today, uh, but Visigoths, Ostrogoths, this goth, that goth, I don't know. All right? One of them is known, the Visigoths. They, they had invaded from, I think, east of, uh, even east of Germany, made their way all the way into Spain. And the Visigothic uh, kingdom of Spain at that time in the mid-6th century had some very anti-Jewish uh, rules. Uh, and uh, nonetheless, Jews were able to live, survive in some various forms. Okay. Uh, now, by the time we get, uh, after, not long after Islam comes into being, the majority of Jews end up living under Islamic rule because the majority of the Jews were in the, like around the Mediterranean basin, especially North Africa and in Iraq, Syria, uh, up the, the coast. Uh, that became under Muslim rule. Uh, and uh, later when they conquered Spain, uh, that was added to that uh, Islamic world. So Muhammad is around the year 570 to 632. In the year 638, the Muslims conquered Jerusalem. And so by mid-8th century, the Mediterranean Basin was under Islam. Uh, I mentioned the Khazars, I think, briefly when I talked about philosophy, the kingdom of the Khazars around 740. Uh, in which some of the some of them converted to Judaism. The, the, the tradition is that the king did. Some of the royalty it was not really clear, <clears throat> but it, uh, it was to some extent a Jewish kingdom in in uh, amongst the Slavs uh, until it was overrun by the Russians and and wiped out around 1016. Right. Now under Muslim rule, it was generally benign. No, uh, there was no attempts to forcibly convert Jews or Christians, for that matter. But they were known as dhimis, right? They were unbelievers. Their status was clearly secondary to uh, 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 a, a Muslim. Conversion because of favorable con uh, consideration conditions for Muslims would come about. Arabic became the dominant language of that part of the world. Uh, the Muslims uh, rediscovered Greek philosophy, and a lot of Greek philosophy gets translated into Arabic, and that's how Maimonides knew his his Greek philosophy from the texts that uh, came from these uh, uh, sources. But you had Jews having uh, oftentimes positions of uh, a great authority. Uh, there was a, a courtier known as Chastai Ibn Shaprut. The Ibn is the Arabic way of saying Ben. Right? So sometimes you see that even the, the titles uh, become affected by the Arabic uh, culture. Uh, so Chastai Ibn Shaprut, who dies around the year 1056, he was a courtier, he was a rabbi, he was uh, a uh, patron of Jewish poetry. So we have poetry being written at this time, some of it which many modern, very right-wing Orthodox would consider scandalous. Uh, but that was there. There was a man by the name of Shmuel Hanagid, 993 to 1055. He was a, not only a scholar, a courtier at the court, right? But he was also a general. He led Muslim armies at that time. Uh, now, in 1146, uh, a group of uh, Muslims uh, by, that were called Almohads, uh, my notes call it a fanatical sect, uh, they're fanatical in the sense that they outlawed Christianity and Judaism under their rule. And that's the around the time of Maimonides, there's 
questions among some scholars as to whether or not his family pretended to be Muslims. He writes later on when he was asked questions about Jews who were forcibly converted to Islam, uh, and he was very sympathetic to them. Uh, there, uh, a very famous letter that he wrote, uh, a rabbi from Europe, European rabbi, uh, had written condemning those who converted, said, you can't come back, you're, you're gone forever, forget it, you're no good, whatever you do is terrible, even if you try to act as a Jew. And Maimonides upbraids him and, and attacks his position and, and, and says, you know, uh, this, this is a, especially in Yemen at this point in time, there was a whole problems that Jews have been for, forced to be converted. And he, he said, it's just a few words. He said, Allah, you know, Allah is God. And Muhammad Hibbs is probably, it's his words. You're not saying it. You don't mean it. Don't let it get you. When you can, get away from there. Which, of course, is my Monday story. We know that he got away. Whether or not he and his family spent some time uh, pretending to be Muslim, it's not clear. Uh, now, at first, Spain had the, the, the situation of Jews in Spain after the Visigoths were overthrown by the Muslims went up. That's why I was talking about some of these same the individuals like uh, Ibn Shaprut and uh, Shmuel Anagid, then come along the Amohads in the late 11th century, and, and it goes down. And then somewhere after that, uh, we begin to have what is considered to be the golden age of, of Spanish Jewry. It, uh, because of the Islamic influence of philosophy, Jewish uh, scholars studied philosophy. They studied science. They were involved with the intellectual pursuits of their era, for good and bad. Unlike the Jews in Northern Europe, in France and Germany, where their neighbors were often uh, illiterate for the most part, and certainly didn't study uh, anything except scripture, there was nothing in common to bridge to create this intellectual give and take. There was probably some, but it was at a distance. We we hear, and then there's a was a wonderful program done by uh, uh, PBS talking about uh, the golden age of Spain, talking about all the communities in Spain in that era. If you can get have a copy of the the video, if you can find a copy of it, it's a fascinating look at that era. Um, so we do not we're not absent of conflict. Uh, we always say two Jews, three opinions. Maimonides was was attacked by uh, many who felt philosophy was a threat to the orthodoxy of their day, as did some Christian theologians and Muslim theologians. And we have the famous story of his 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 uh, book being burned. But one, uh, we also know that the church discovered apparently that the Jews weren't just reading scripture and misunderstanding what was in scripture, but they had this whole other literature that they seemed to be unaware of, the Talmud and the various rabbinic writings. And when they discovered this, they, they declared the Talmud to be a heretical work. It led the Jews away from the truth. Uh, and if you go online today, you will find all kinds of claims about what's in the Talmud of terrible, terrible things. Yeah, there are some things in it that are not very nice to non-Jews. As across the world, people weren't always very nice about other people's. Right? There's, it's in there. There's no question about it. But if far from his dominant subject matter of what the Talmud's all about. And many of the things that they claim are not there. So in 1242, uh, the Talmud was burned in Paris, and and cartloads of books 
uh, were burned uh, by the church as a way of attacking Judaism. Uh, and it's around this time that the mystical uh, aspect of Jewish tradition really starts to, to flourish, begin to flourish. Uh, Judah HaLevi, we mentioned uh, with the Kuzari, and he dies 1141, just to give you kind of time frame. Uh, Nachmanides, Moses ben Nachman, uh, 1194 through 1270, uh, commentator on both the Talmud and the uh, the Torah, uh, and he was part of that mystical tradition. Uh, and uh, then finally, his student, uh, a man by the name of uh, Solomon, uh, not his student, but a student of his student, uh, Solomon Ibn Adret, banned, this is, he's between 1235 and 1310, banned the study of philosophy. That's how it went through into the Jewish community. All right, so the Jews lived throughout the Middle East, throughout North Africa, pretty much being part and parcel of whatever the intellectual pursuits were going on, uh, practicing many trades. They did own land. They did uh, uh, were smiths, silversmiths, goldsmiths all kinds of things. Uh, and while separate from the Muslim community, at the same time, tolerated more by the Muslim community. That was somewhat different in Europe, in, especially in where the bulk of the Jews were at this time, the early Middle Ages, the 900s, uh, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, in uh, Italy, we're cutting it. We're not putting Spain in Europe for right now. Poor Spain, they get pushed out of my our bar story. So they're, they're the Muslims, so they're not part of Europeans. Uh, nothing negative meant there. There's, okay. Um, but the Jews were living in Italy. They were living in France. They were living in Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, that whole area. All right. Uh, so we've mentioned in the past Rashi. Rashi uh, was lived in a, a town called Troyes. Uh, he dies around ten. Uh, who's is a, uh, was born in ten forty and dies in eleven o five. And there were small Jewish communities southeast of Paris that had a, a, a small Jewish communities. Most of the Europe the European Jewish communities were small. Uh, numbered in, you can number the families. Uh, there's a famous question, it comes from the Middle Ages to show you how this worked. In Jewish tradition, we say that the first person called up to the Torah on Shabbat or a weekday is a Kohen. Second person is traditionally was a Levi, and then it, uh, anybody else for the rest of the Aliyot. Okay. So if you didn't have a Kohen, so you just skipped. No Kohen. You could either start with a Levi or start with Yisrael. Okay. That wasn't the problem. The problem was, what happens if you have a city that's only made up of Kohanim? Everybody in town is a Kohen. How could that be? They're all related. You know, they're a bunch of families. They're all related to each other. Everybody's a Kohen because of, of the, the uh, paternal ancestry that's involved with it. And they, some, what do we do? that tells you how small the community had to be that that a kind of a question would even arise. You, you follow? Okay. Um, so you had small communities, but nonetheless, they were the source of all kinds of terrible things. Uh, in 1190, if you go to York, York in England. Uh, one of the things that York is famous for is a massacre of 150 Jews in 1190, uh, in the York Massacre. You know, the tour guides will tell you a little bit about it, and they take you to where the, the uh, bishop's uh, fortress, really, it was more of a fortress, and that's in, in, uh, where the Jews had taken refuge and were, were uh, slaughtered. 
Of course, that's not the real fortress that was built later on, but you know, the tour guides will sometimes tell you that, sometimes they won't. Um, 1095 through 1291, you have the Christian Crusades. Ostensibly uh, to uh, conquer uh, the land of Israel from the Muslims. Uh, and indeed, they managed to temporarily capture Jerusalem in 1099. Uh, but as the crusading groups, as the various crusades go through Europe, why do we have to go all the way over there to kill infidels? We got these Jewish infidels in our backyard uh, that they would slaughter. Um, if that wasn't good enough, then there was the blood libel. Jews would uh, kill uh, Christian children. That's the, the York ma uh, massacre was related to one of those claims to use their blood to make matzahs. Okay. Uh, I think I mentioned last this week or before. That's why in some Jewish communities, while red wine was always considered to be better for ritual purposes, for Passover, they intentionally used white wine. So they could not be confused with blood. Uh, Jews were accused of stealing the consecrated host. Uh, the, uh, right, the, in, in Catholic and some Protestant traditions, right, the part of the, the ritual, uh, wafers are said to be the body of, of Jesus and, and the wine is his blood, which always, you know, always crazy. It's, it's the Christians who drink blood and the Jews who cannot have blood in their meat at all, but it's the Jews who drink the blood. So you, you go figure. All right. Uh, but they would steal these the consecrated hosts and torture them and get blood from them and whatever evil purposes they had. <clears throat> and they were accused of usury. Of course, they were accused of usury. Everybody, you know, you know, Christians cannot charge interest to Christians. Jews cannot charge interest to Jews. But Jews could charge interest to Christians, and Christians could charge interest to Jews. So I'm not sure what usury amounted to. 30 to 50 percent was normative. All right? We read, you know, uh, Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice uh, reflects that reality. Uh but uh, and one of the uh, popular things to do is that wars cost money. Uh, local uh, figures, bishops or or or, or, or dukes or, or whatever le level of nobility is around, need money to to uh, to serve when they get, need to go to war. They need money for this, that, and to to make put food on the table. They borrow from the Jew. The Jew lends the money. When time comes to pay it back, uh, let's kick the Jews out of town so they don't have to pay it back. Um, so they were during the time of the Black Death, they were obviously uh, poisoning the wells. That's why people died. Well, the Jews died too, but uh, uh, and, uh, that's because they made a mistake, I guess, and drank the wrong, from the wrong well. Uh, finally, in the year 1240, all Jews in England uh, uh, under King Henry III uh, were uh, blamed for counterfeiting money, and uh, the king uh, expelled uh, the Jewish subjects uh, ostensibly to save them from harm because the local citizens were attacking the Jews because they counterfeited currency. Who knows they may have, for all I know. Uh, but in order to save them, the king kicked them out of England. I don't remember exactly when uh, the official return of Jews to England was uh, what came about, but it was not until the time of Shakespeare, for example, there were no l l Jews living in England legally. Now, in Spain, turning back to Spain that I kicked out of Europe for a while, um, we had a steady process of Christians reconquering the various uh, areas of Spain, the Reconquista. Okay. And uh, finally, with the, the conquest of Granada in 1492, or I think it's around 1492. Um, anyway, uh, under Ferdinand and Isabella, they united the entire uh, 
peninsula of Spain under one rule. And they, in 1492, expelled all the Jews who lived in Spain. Now, this was the result of a process of a number of different uh, things. Pressure upon Jews in Spain had been going on wherever Christians lived and had control. There was great pressure on Jews to convert to Christianity. Many did, for various and sundry reasons. Right? The pressure, the opportunity, what the threats, what have you. So a large number of these conversos were not so sincere. And at the same time, they had relatives who were observant Jews. Okay, So on the one hand, you have the conversos, ostensibly Catholic. On the other hand, you have their cousins and whatever, ostensibly Jews. And they were on good terms with each other. And so obviously, the Jews were trying to entice them not to observe Christianity properly which is a no-no. If you are a Christian who practices anything the church has decided is not proper under the church's understanding of Christianity, you're a heretic. And so one of the things that uh, Ferdinand Isabella brought in earlier was the... Uh, um, Inquisition. Theoretically, the Inquisition could only have power over Christians. Right? They had no power over a Jew who had never, ever become Christian. Right? Now, also, if you informed on a heretic... You might profit by that by getting some of the property that had belonged to the heretic. So if the heretic was a converso, a new a new Christian, and he was of Jewish, he or she was of Jewish ancestry, that was already enough to make them suspect. And if they had enough money and you got jealous or whatever reason, that's often a good reason to turn them over to the church. And later on, after 1492, when the Jews were expelled and some Jews didn't leave, they did convert to Christianity. Again, well, I don't know how, how uh, uh, reliable you want or uh, will consider somebody was forcibly converted to religion to be really caring about the religious aspects of the forced conversion. Sometimes there's this ignorance. They, you know, you're uh, you're a Jew, you're a Christian now. You've been baptized. You're a Christian. Go and live a Christian life. What does that mean? I don't know. I never ate pork, so I don't eat pork. Good Christians eat pork. Uh, I like candles on Friday night. No, no, no. That's Judaizing. That's heresy. So some Jews were completely uh, uh, accepting of their new faith but got on the wrong side of somebody's uh, greed. Or they were new Christians who didn't really know that much and just made mistakes, but that became known. And there were some who secretly practiced their Judaism. And they were called uh, Muranos, which is, means pigs, if I recall correctly. It's not a nice name. But it was a name that we we rep understand the, the reality, and we know up until the modern age, there have been families of of Spanish ancestry who had traditions that they practiced that clearly were Jewish, and even and there's been efforts in the southwest of the United States and in, and in Mexico to find some of these people who uh, the people who are looking for them assume that they're really of Jewish ancestry. But most of them have no idea why they do what they do. It's been so long and, and, and just this is what we always did. 
you know, it's like the famous question that the little girl sees her mother cutting the ends of a brisket off to put in the pot. And so she says, Mommy, why do you cut the ends of the brisket, the meat, to put in the pot? He says, I don't know. Grandma did that. So you go to Grandma. Grandma, why do you cut the ends of the brisket off when you put it in the pot? She says, I don't know. Bubby always did it. So they go to Bobby. Bobby, why do you cut the ends of the brisket off before you put it in the pot? She says, simple. Wouldn't fit otherwise. Mm -hmm. right? so sometimes that's what things are. Sometimes it was we we quietly light candles on Friday. Don't tell anybody that we're going to light these candles Friday night. Grandma did it. Great grandmother did it. Great, great, great grandmother did it. Great, all the way back to forever. But we don't tell anybody. That's our custom. But why? I don't know. That's what we do. So we have that uh, reality. Um, so with as I said, in 1492, the Jews are expelled from Spain. Not long after, they're expelled from Portugal. But in Portugal, they weren't expelled. They were forcibly converted. Uh, and that, con that uh, the Spanish uh, exodus had a great influence, as I mentioned, when we talked about uh, the, uh, the Kabbalists of Sfat in that era of, of mysticism. Right. If we turn back to, to uh, the, the regular rest of, of, of uh, Europe, uh, we had a new institution that was introduced on the 29th of March, 1516, in the city of Venice, in Italy. Uh, they didn't know what they wanted to do with the Jews. Uh, they wanted to have the economic advantage of, of Jewish presence, Jewish merchants, they went different places, they had connections. One of the reasons why Jews were so involved in trade was they had a cousin here and somebody over there, and you know they 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 could go to the next community and they go to the synagogue and meet people, right? So that was beneficial to Venice, but they didn't want Jews influencing good Catholics. Uh, so by concentrating and isolating, uh, they provide the Jews with security and protection. Uh, for the Jews and for the Christians. Now, it's always true that Jews tended to live in the same neighborhoods, which is true of every ethnic group, right? Ethnic groups tend to go where other people, their ethnic background is. It's, it's convenient. You know people, you know the language, you know the food. Uh, but this was a voluntary thing. Now it became legal. In the area, debates about what exactly the basis of it is. Some say it's because the, the, there was an old uh, cannon factory there and somehow the word ghetto is related to the word cannons or something like that. That became the first official ghetto. Uh, it tells you that the Jews were there, Jews were part of the community, the Jews' as, uh, economic power was appreciated well, at the same time, uh, left with uh, feelings that you had to, you know, keep them at arm's length. Right? So that, uh, in, in again, the Merchant of Venice reflects that that I, whole idea. Um, so a large number of Jews at this time were involved in commerce, trade. Uh, various entrep uh, entrepreneurial uh, think things. All right. So now, if you were to take and plot the movement of Jews, you start with Eretz Yisrael, all right, on the, the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And you have Jews going across North Africa up into Spain. Jews going north uh, into Asia Minor, to Greece, the Balkans, uh, some going through Italy uh, up into Western Europe. It was getting very, uh, as we've seen, that the pressures uh, 
on Jews in that part of the world was sometimes extremely difficult. And um, there began a process of Eastern migration. We always think of people moving West, go West young man, right? Or young woman. Uh, the Jewish movement was eastward. Uh, and, you know, uh, Poland is an interesting uh, historical uh, enterprise. Uh, I don't claim to understand the, all the ins and outs of it. Uh, but um, Jew in the uh, at a certain stage of Polish history, uh, Germans and Jews were invited to come in to the areas of Poland because they were lacking of people. And Jews were given certain prerogatives by the crown. And so they started moving eastward into Poland and Lithuania. They already been living in Czechoslovakia in those areas. And um, It became eventually a kind of a, a, a shelter for Jews uh, from various other European communities. And according to some sources, about three quarters of the world's Jews lived in Poland by the middle of the 16th century. Which is an interesting phenomenon because uh, uh, Sephardic Jewry had been much larger in numbers than Ashkenazic Jewry due to various factors, including the the anti-semitism uh so that but somehow jewish uh fertility was very large in that part of the world uh but that was not always to, uh to be perfect uh jewish uh, uh the jews often served in uh, the same kind of capacities that they had served in in Western Europe, uh, those without a lot of money, petty loans. Who do you give petty loans to? The local peasants, for whatever reason. And you know, when you want to borrow money, that guy's your friend. When you he wants his money back, uh, you're not so friendly with him. All right? So that's an issue of tension. And of course, the people who were borrowing money always felt they were being cheated. Right? They were being charged too much interest. Uh, and the, those lending the money always thought, well, these guys don't work hard enough. They don't pay up properly. They don't follow what they should in order to, to manage their lives. And so then they blame us because of that. Okay? So that, you know, there are almost always two sides to a coin. You know, the, Jewish attitude towards some of the, the peasants of, of Eastern Europe was not necessarily the best of uh, intentions. Right? Those who were in higher positions often became uh, overseers for the states of the Polish nobility. The Polish nobility was Roman Catholic. The Polish peasants, especially in Ukraine in that area, which is part of Poland and Ukraine at that time, were Orthodox. So there, there's a conflict between the Polish aristocracy and the peasantry that exists. And who is the go-between between the aristocracy and the peasants? The Jewish overseer, the r and R, as they were called. So when the Khamenei uh, uprisings of 648 came about, and this, these were the Cossack uprisings uh, against the Polish overlords, they attacked the Jews just as much as they attacked the nobility. Uh, and, and depending upon who you read and how much the, the massacres were horrendous in numbers, smaller numbers, it depends which historians you look at, and they all have their own opinions. But it was a, a devastating blow. So this is in 1648. Uh, and we also have, around the same time, 
the reemergence of the, this reemergence of mysticism becoming a very important element in the Eastern European world. Uh, and uh, you have a number of false messiahs, the most famous being Shabtai Tzvi, who dies in 1676, uh, all right? The, the Chalmaniki massacre was 1648, and then you have uh, Shabtai Tzvi around the same time. A lot of Jews truly believed that he was the Mashiach, he was the Messiah. Some sold their homes and got ready to go to the land of Israel. And uh, when he, Shabtai Tzvi, goes to see the uh, caliph in, in Turkey, he's promptly given a choice, convert to Islam or die. So he converts. Some Jews, the majority of Jews, felt uh, uh, that it was a terrible thing that took place. They had been tricked. Some Jews felt that no, they had not been tricked. He really was the Messiah, but there's something going on here. Some of those said, well, because he's the Messiah and because times are so bad, uh, if you remember, I talked about in, in the mystical idea that when the world was created, there was this cosmic catastrophe and the the, the uh, spherot shattered and the klipot, the pieces of the of these spherot, captured sparks. Well, some of those sparks are so deep down that it requires somebody of great righteousness to descend to the depths in order to release the sparks. So Shabtai Tzvi, who was the Mashiach, a real tzaddik, a really truly righteous person, he had to pretend to become a Muslim so he could go down to the very depths to free those sparks. That's for him. We can still believe in him, but that's something he does, not us. Others said, no, we have to do it too. And so some converted to Islam. They became known as the Donme, and they were around until a few, uh, around the beginning of the 20th century. They only married amongst themselves. They practiced Judaism on a certain level, but outwardly they were Muslims. Uh, another individual was a, name of, a man by the name of Jacob Frank, and this is in the Christian world, and he was quite a figure, uh, and uh, he uh, well, was sort of like the rock and roll stars of the 60s, mm -hmm. late 60s and 70s. I'm very popular with some people. Uh, he's accused of having orgies, uh, which probably is true because part of the ideology that they created was in order to free the sparks of holiness that were so far down, we have to commit sins in order to free the sparks. All right, so they, they rationalized it that way. Um, so this was the world in which Hasidism uh, comes in not long, far after that. Uh, I always have this when I do this. Um, okay, so the Jewish community was self-governing for the most part. Uh, it had its own leadership. Rabbis were an important element of that leadership, but also uh, wealthy people, which is always seems to have something to do with leadership of communities. Uh, even in our democratic world, you've got the guilt, the money. Uh, sometimes you seem to get the power, whether you're out front or behind. All right. So how did the Jewish community control its members when you needed to have a coercive power? The harem. If somebody 
disobeyed with me. For example, again, I was referring to some of these earlier uh, writings. This is in the 10th, 11th century. About taxes. Some guys were, the, the community said, all right, this is the taxes we have to pay. We're divvying it up. Each person has to pay based upon their wealth. Chaim and, and, and Yankel, you have to pay 100 ducats, each one of you. They say, I don't want to. I'm not going to do it. What right have you to tell me what to do? So what they do is they put them in harem, excommunicate. No Jew will have anything to do with them. Their children will not be educated in the schools. They will not be buried in the cemetery. They can't be, we won't be married in the community. That was the 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 uh, stick that uh, enabled the powers to that be to run matters. Okay. So one of the famous examples of that uh, took place on uh, was, is that the right date? Twenty fourth right. of November, sixteen thirty two. Baruch de Spinoza, uh, who was a Dutch philosopher of Sephardi Portuguese origin, and he certainly laid the groundworks for 18th century enlightenment and modern biblical criticism and various other things in philosophy. Uh, he was excommunicated. The Jewish community authorities felt that he was a danger to the Jewish community. And if he doesn't uh, retract what he's been writing and saying, you'll be excommunicated. All right, so I'm excommunicated. It didn't bother him. Uh, but that's one of the most famous uh, cases of excommunication that we have, that we know about. Okay. So uh, when the community came up against uh, a uh, an issue that they felt was there a question there, Leon? Oh. Uh, that they uh, needed to control excommunication. The harem, <laughs> the harem was uh, the means of doing it. Okay, so now sixteen ninety eight. A man by the name of Israel Ben Ezer uh, was born and dies in 1760. He's referred to uh, 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 as the Besht, the Baal Shem Tov, master of the good name. There were a lot of Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov meant somebody who had mystical powers or was seen to have mystical powers. Uh, the Besht as he's referred to, Israel and Israel, um, created the movement that became known as Hasidut, Hasidism. Uh, and it centers around the idea of a tzaddik, a person who's, who has a certain level of religious aura uh, and the followers who are with him, around him, uh, see him as being a bridge to the divine. Uh, and he emphasizes the emotional aspect of prayer. And um, the, the, there are various versions of the story and various rabbis who are put in the center of it. But one version goes like this. There was a, uh, a simple shepherd boy who went to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. And the only thing he had ever learned was the Aleph Bet, Aleph Bet, Gimel, Dalet. All right, so he kept repeating Aleph Bet. He didn't know this prayer book. He couldn't read it, just knew the letters. And people were getting upset, and they were trying to shush him. And so the Baal Shem Tov was there, and he said, stop. Our prayers were caught here in the synagogue. They wouldn't go up to heaven until he said the Aleph Beth, Beis, excuse me, Aleph Beis. And that opened the gates of heaven for our prayers to go up, because he said it in all sincerity. Other versions of it, he blew a whistle. 
Uh, another version of the story is this, there's a, a, a rabbi going on a trip and he goes in the middle of the forest and he comes upon this Jewish man and this Jewish man knows nothing. And he says, well, what do you do? He says, every day I pray God watch over me, watch over my work and I should prosper and do well by my family. And I said, no, 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 that's not right. You have to, to say the Shema, you got to say all these prayers and spend several days with this guy going over all of this. And then the rabbi goes on his trip. And then the next day when the rabbi's not there, the guy gets up and he says, I don't remember what he told me to do. I can't remember all the things, but I can't do what I did before. So I do nothing. So the power of the Hasidic ideal is to the emphasis on spirituality, on prayer as an effort of reaching out uh, emotionally. Now, the Jewish community, especially in, uh, say, Lithuania, Vilna, uh, was a center of uh, intellectual Judaism. The study of Talmud was preeminent. The community supported scholars. One of the greatest scholars of all of Jewish history was a man by the name, uh, also Eliyahu, the Vilna Gaon. Elijah ben Solomon Zalman, uh, born in 1720, dies in 1797. And he was this figure of the greatness of what a Jew could be. Now, most people can't really reach that peak. Some can reach this peak, some can reach this peak. Most of us are down here, right? Intellectually, we do what we can, but we're never, and the masses often felt that they were not important. They couldn't learn Talmud like the great scholars. Furthermore, the great scholars, because of support from the wealthy in the community, there was perhaps an unhealthy relationship between some of the leading rabbinic figures and, and the moneyed people. And so these lower groups were ones that were most attracted to the Hasidic movement. Uh, and it was opposed, and the, the, the opposition were called mitnagdim, or uh, the way we, they have pronounced it, misnagdim, those who were opposed. Hasidim were the pietists, misnagdim were the opponents. And it was a vicious fight. Uh, and both sides put the other side in the harem. And the Vilna Gaon was at least uh, said to have been on the side of the anti-Hasidim uh, for many reasons, including the emphasis on Kabbalah and spreading Kabbalah to the masses, which was part of the, uh, the Hasidic approach. Uh, and when he dies, his students become their own rebbies in different circles, and their students become rebbies. Sometimes it was a very much abused position. Sometimes it was an abusement from below. What do I mean? Uh, if the Rebbe is a tzaddik, a really great person, an important individual, they should have those things that go with important individuals. Just like the king has a fancy a chariot, a carriage from the era. The tzaddik should have a nice carriage. He should have nice clothes. He should have all these things. So we're going to give money to him so he has them. Sometimes they were charlatans, which isn't everything in the world. And sometimes they were people that were pushed into it by their own followers. You know, you have a little bit of both that goes on in, in, in that kind of circumstance. Uh, so the Hasidim were the rebels of Eastern Europe in the 17th, 18th century. 18th century, excuse me, not, uh, and maybe the beginning of the 19th century. Today, they're part of the Orthodox establishment. Right? Very much part of the Orthodox establishment. And while they may have been, some of them may have been anti-intellectual when they first began, 
as time went by, some became much more uh, on the uh, uh, intellectual side of, of Jewish uh, life. One of the most famous is the Chabad, Lubavitch. Chabad Lubavitch, it's called Lubavitch because that's the town where, where uh, the original Rebbe came from. And often they're, they're known by the towns. The Ger Rebbe comes from Ger. The Satomer Rebbe comes from Satomer. Right? Not, not a big, and the, the Square Rebbe came from Square. That's your family, Square? No, no. No, okay. Uh, and in New York, there's a place called New Square because Square Hasidim started that community and they called the town New Square, New Square. Right? Um, so the Chabad, uh, the title comes from Chochum Binadat, which is part of the, the uh, ideological uh, framework that they operate under, were very much interested in reaching out to people. They were not and still are not the largest Hasidic group. The uh, Satmar, I think, is bigger than Chabad. Uh, Ger is certainly bigger than Chabad, but you, uh, but they, under the leadership of the previous Rebbe and the, and, and the last Rebbe, especially Menachem Shir Zaman, uh, sent out emissaries. They sent people all over the place to go and create Jewish communities. They're the ones you'll see in front of the grocery stores. Did you put on tefillin this morning? To the men, they won't say it to the ladies. Don't worry about it. Uh, did you put on tefillin today? Uh, I remember uh, several months ago, right at, not long after the outbreak of the fighting in, in Gaza, I was at a rally, and as was to be expected, one of the uh, Lubavitchers was around getting men to put on tefillin, and he comes up to me, and I said, well, you know what, do you have Rabbeinu Tom's tefillin? And he, he laughed at the joke, too. There are two kinds of tefillin, right? Rashi's, which most of us wear, and there's another one called Rabbeinu Tom. Some you wear both of them. And they always use Rashi's tefillin. So I said, if you got Rabbeinu Tom's tefillin, I'll put on. Uh, okay. uh, but they reach out. They have tried to get women to light Shabbos candles. And, and they give out uh, uh, kits to, to people. And so they've had a very, very powerful impact on the Jewish community. Again, for good and bad. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But if you go anywhere in the world and you want to find a Jewish community, uh, Chabad, bless them, are probably there. Yes. Is it true that the uh, garb, excuse me, the form of Hasidim is like to copy that way, the nobility of the European? That's that is what is uh, I've heard that the the long caftan, yeah, or uh, uh, not necessarily the caftan. The caftan is more of uh, uh, Eastern and and even uh, uh, North African thing, but the long uh, dark. Uh, is it Prince Edward coats? What do you call it? But that's what the fancy people wore, and their rabbi started to wear it. The, the ordinary uh, chosid couldn't afford it. He wore what he could, uh, and the fur hats. I don't know where that comes from, but these were different things that uh, uh, at that time they did. I think. I heard this triangle was like a simulation of a Russian hat. It probably was. Uh, no, and, and and probably a lot of these things came about to emphasize the rebbe's as being nobility, okay. And as people got wealthier or could afford it, or prices came down, whatever the case may be, became more and more. So, but by today's standard, the dark suits and white shirts is a standard throughout the more orthodox world, as to distinguish Jew from Gentile. That's part of it. It's, it's a uniform. You, know, you look at the black hat and, and the black and the dark suits, it's a uniform. And it serves as an identifiable uniform. And, and part of the purpose of that is to unite, and part of the purpose is to divide. Okay, so yeah, and how the you know the various things came about. A lot of Hasidic melodies seemed, to, uh, at least according to musicologists, were originally drinking songs in in, in taverns and things like that that Jews picked up, and they you know, and it became uh, a melody that they had. Okay, we don't know where it comes from anymore, so you know, uh, a lot of things work like that. 
because you know, and what's fascinating about it is you know, glad you, there's this concept that we're not supposed to ape the Gentile. What they, they do, we shouldn't try and copy them. And yet we see things like that, which clearly are, but they became accepted. Just like uh, you will hear, uh, especially in the Orthodox world, authorities who, I'm, I, I'm, uh, who condemn any changes in the prayer book. On the other hand, they use the prayer book that became very popular on the result, uh, because of Hasidim, we called Nusach uh, uh, Arizal, or uh, Nusach Sard, which changed the standard Ashkenazic prayer book. Can't do that today, I mean, but then they did. Okay, there was a uh, question. With the eclipse, should we say a blessing on seeing the eclipse? Because we have all kinds of blessings that we say, and the answer given was no, we don't create blessings today. But if we're not look, you're not looking, we can change the prayer book. All right. <laughs> I heard that was the general thing. I'm sorry. I suppose that's a possibility. Yeah, it may, but nobody else seems. Uh, you, I accept your uh, suggestion, but most, uh, do it. yeah, most didn't say to do it either. And I don't know, can you say it on a partial eclipse or it has to be a full eclipse? After you can say it on your own. <laughs> I we'll have to research that one. I do know that they see this uh, 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 Broncos never set on an eclipse, but it is set on things like shooting stars. And yeah, like yeah. Uh, there are nat natural wonders. There, there's a blessing for it. Probably it, one explanation is that uh, often uh, eclipse. The idea of eclipses had a negative mm -hmm. aspect to them, and a lot of people felt uncomfortable with eclipses and what have you. And uh, that may have influenced the desire not to create a blessing, although we're supposed to say a blessing when we accept death. So, all right. All right. I just, uh, okay. Uh, so Hasidism arises, it develops and grows very highly in Poland and Ukraine, uh, that part of the world. Uh, the uh, Jewish world starts to expand in 1654 when Jews settled in New Amsterdam. Anybody know where, where New Amsterdam is? Sure. New York. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, it was in, when Brazil was settled, for originally the Portuguese had taken over, conquered Brazil. Uh, and the Dutch for a period of time were a sea power and they kicked the Portuguese out of Brazil. And the Dutch always had a much more tolerant attitude towards uh, Jews, at least in, in, in that era. era. Uh, and there's large Jewish community in Amsterdam, in the environs. Uh, and so when the Dutch took over Brazil, some of the Portuguese uh, Muranos practiced Judaism in the open because they didn't have to worry about the Inquisition anymore. When the Portuguese came back in, they, they left and ended up a small group in coming to New York, New Amsterdam at the time. Uh, and uh, the Peter Stuyvesant, who was the, the head of the at the time, didn't want to let Jews in. But the Dutch West Indies Company had a number of Jewish shareholders on in it, so he let them in. There was a Jew who wanted to uh, be a burger, a, not a hamburger, uh, a full-fledged citizen, allowing him to vote for for certain offices. But in order to do that, you had to serve in the militia, and he didn't want to let him serve in the militia. Send word back to Amsterdam. Word comes back. Let him. So be uh, serve in the militia. So the first Jewish community in North America was uh, of exiles from originally from Portugal through Brazil to uh, New York. Uh, here and fifth, and, and it was only two years later that Jews were permitted legally to settle in England. Okay. Uh, we mentioned Moses Mendelssohn passing. Uh, and we're up to the time of the French Revolution, which I alluded to a little bit earlier, as the ideas of, of enlightenment spread through Europe. 
and the concept of uh, some kind of democratic principles. Question came up about citizenship. What was the role of Jews? How should they be handled? Uh, and it was uh, said that, that the Jews as individuals could become French citizens, but not the Jewish community. That was not, their, their communal existence was, uh, was eliminated. Didn't mean that there weren't communities, didn't mean they had some kinds of uh, uh, local uh, services, uh, uh, groups and kinds of things, service groups, uh, but they were to be seen as French citizens. Uh, they could. Some communities had taxes that supported the uh, clergy, so the Jews were allowed to uh, collect those taxes to support uh, Jewish institutions. Uh, you had that especially in Germany, the Gemeinde, uh, and uh, in France too, I believe they have a certain kind of thing like that. Uh, now, what is interesting is when uh, orthodoxy came into being, and we'll talk about that later on, uh, one of the first acts was uh, under leadership of, of Samson Rafael Hirsch, was to withdraw from the Gemeinde because that was controlled by reformers and he didn't like that. And, and so he he left he, he, uh, the, the authority of the Gemeinde to create their own separate community. That's one of the things that we're not going to get into right now, nor are we going to get into the story of Zionism. That's for a, a later date. Okay. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the United States, just real briefly, we know that there were Jews who settled in uh, New York, as you said, very early. Some Jews came uh, later on. There were not a lot of Jews, but uh, what number, what there were, were mostly of Sephardic, Spanish, Portuguese descent uh, at the time of the American Revolution. Uh, we know that there were small community, they were there. And there's a fa famously a letter that was written to J George Washington as the president, uh, which the Jewish community in Rhode Island, the synagogue in Rhode Island, was was basically checking out what's going to be with Jews in this new republic, in which he wrote, famously wrote a letter saying, you know, basically saying, you're citizens like everybody else. And for the uh, most part of American history, while there have been issues and there have been anti-Semites uh, that we're not going to now, uh, there was never an official, well, there was one exception during the Civil War with, with President President General Grant kicking Jews out of a certain area and being countermanded by President Lincoln. Uh, but uh, you had growing masses in the 1840s. They were uh, Jews from Germany in middle and uh, Bohemia because you had the 1848 revolutions and uh, a lot of the members fled, number of Jews fled, they came to America. Uh, they spread out a lot, became merchants, peddlers, settled in a lot of small towns in North America and some in Canada as well. Uh, we'll come back to the Canadian story in a minute. Uh, and in a lot of communities throughout North the United States, the local peddler became the local uh, what, uh, what's his name? The, the kind of store, you know, everything store. General store. General, General store, store, thank you. And eventually became the the uh, uh, store that you went to, the department store. I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, Cohen Brothers. Who do you think started Cohen Brothers? <laughs> okay. In those days, that was a big uh, department store. And you go throughout the United States and in communities of various kinds, you have these establishments that were the result of these European German Jews moving there, creating their communities. Eventually, mostly became reform. We'll, again, we'll talk about that later on. Now, and then in the 1890s, up until around 1900, you had the large influx of Eastern European Jews, especially from Poland to Russia, uh, as a result of all kinds of things that were going on there. Uh, and... Uh, that became the predominant face of North American Jewry, Ashkenazi Eastern European Jewry. Uh, each each wave 
kind of uh, overwhelmed the previous wave. Each wave had different feel, mixed feelings about the wave that was coming. And uh, they, they developed in certain different ways. All right. I have time and I want to uh, talk about Canada a little bit. The Canadian Jewish story, uh, in which some of you probably know better than I. Uh, in 1608, when Samuel de Champlain founded the French colony of New France, right, it was settled by strict Roman Catholics who, under Cardinal Richelieu's decree of 1627, refused settlement of non Catholics in the new ter French territory. So Jews and non Catholics were not welcome. Uh, it was not until 1760, during the French and Indian War, that the first group of Jews who were soldiers in the British Army set foot in Canada. The first Jewish settlement was in that same year made up of Jewish officers, soldiers, merchants, and fur traders. After the British gained control of Montreal in September 1760, a small Jewish population remained in the area. Uh, and then with the lifting of the decree of 1627, after the surrender of all of New France under the Treaty of Paris in 1763, small, small numbers of Jews began to arrive from 13 colonies, from England, Netherlands, and Germany. Uh, on June 5th, 1832, Canadian Jews gained full rights as British subjects, including the right to sit in Parliament and hold public office. That doesn't mean it came about, but in theory they had it. Uh, the Jewish population of Canada rose slowly but steadily throughout the 19th century. In the 1840s, Jews from Western and Central Europe established small communities in Hamilton, Kingston, and Toronto. The 1871 census stated that in total, 1,115 Jews lived in Canada. 409 were located in Montreal, 157 in Toronto, 131 in Hamilton, and the remainder scattered along the St. Lawrence Rivers. Uh, some came in during Gold Rush. Also in the late 1880s, large numbers of Eastern European Jews escaping the pogroms of Tsarist Russia sought refuge in Canada like in the U.S. By 1901, Jewish communities had sprung up all over Canada. Montreal still having the largest number of Jews with 6,975. Toronto with 3,103. Winnipeg, 1,164. I think all of them were communist. I don't <laughs> There's a very strong uh, communist uh, group in there. Vancouver at 224. Nova Scotia, 152. From 1901 to 1911, 52,484 Jewish immigrants came to Canada. Uh, during World War I, records show that 100 Jewish officers and 4,600 soldiers served in the Canadian Army. At least 100 died and 84 were decorated servicemen. Uh, but the records are incomplete and it's thought the numbers were even higher. Uh, at the end of World War I in 1919, the Canadian Jewish Congress was founded to provide assistance to Eastern European Jews in Canada. During its first few years, the organization unified Canadian Jewry and established the Jewish Immigration Aid Society. The CG, CJC was inactive from the mid-20s until the Nazis came to power. During the 30s, the Congress fought against Nazi propaganda, raised funds for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Community Committee, and worked to bring Eastern European Jews to Canada. Uh, the combination of the end of the war and the establishment of the quota system restricting immigration to the United States led to an influx of Jewish uh, immigrants into Canada. And, but it didn't last long. With Hitler's rise to power, thousands of Eastern European Jews sought refuge in Canada but were denied entry. Two orders were enacted at this time. First, in 1930, the Canadian government barred all immigration from Europe with the exception of those with sufficient funds to support themselves on farms and those with immediate family already in the country. The second order came the following year with a further set of restrictions. Only British and American citizens with independent means or who were in the farming, mining, lumbering, or logging industries were considered for residency. 
Uh, now, these anti-immigration policies reflected the mood of the country. Xenophobia and anti-Semitism were rampant, with unemployment and poverty on rise during the Depression. Uh, taking in refugees increased competition for the already scarce number of jobs. In addition, French newspapers and publications attacked Judaism and protested the admittance of Jewish refugees into Canada. Prime Minister W.L. Mackenzie King was sympathetic to the plight of Jews, but was constrained by the widespread opposition to immigration of any kind. In face of such resistance, the Canadian immigration policy remained stringent. Between 1921 and 1931, only 15,800 Jewish immigrants were allowed into Canada. On May 15, 1939, you may have heard of the St. Louis. It was a steamship carrying uh, 907 German Jews fleeing Nazi Germany. It set sail from Hamburg, Germany for Havana, Cuba, but then the, uh, the Cuban government refused to let them uh, in. No other Latin American country would admit refugees, and the St. Louis had to leave port. Canada and the United States were the Jews' last hope, but Mackenzie King ignored the protests of Canadian Jewish organizations and said the crisis was not a Canadian problem. Frederick Charles Blair, the director of the immigration branch of the Department of Mines and Resources, was quoted as saying, no country could open its doors wide enough to take in the hundreds of thousands of Jewish people who want to leave Europe. The line must be drawn somewhere. Canada only took in 8,000 or 1% of the 8, 811,000 Jewish refugees admitted to in countries across the world. Mackenzie adopted a policy of none is too many regarding the immigration of European Jewry seeking refuge from the Nazis. During World War II, uh, approximately 17,000 Jews enlisted in the Canadian Armed Forces, which consisted of more than one-fifth the entire Jewish male population of the country. 10,440 served in the Army, 5,870 in the Air Force, 570 in the Navy. And he claimed the lives of 421 Jews and 1,971 Jews received military awards. Uh, after the war, the Canadian government instituted anti-discrimination laws and eased immigration regulations. The CJC worked to bring displaced persons to Canada and between 1941 and 51, 16,275 Jews immigrated to the country. Post-World War II immigration had a major impact on the composition of Canadian Jewish population. The 1956 Hungarian uprising sent 4,500 Jewish refugees to the country, where they congregated in Toronto. It's estimated between 1946 and 1960, 46,000 Jewish immigrants were admitted to Canada. By 1990, Holocaust survivors and their descendants, this is important to, to take note of, made up around 8% of the U.S. Jewish population, while in Canada, they constituted between 30 and 40% of the Jewish community. There are two things. One, the overwhelming numbers of Jews who came to Canada came after the, first, the immigrations were cut off to the United States. Uh, and so with the post-World War II immigration, uh, in many ways, the sociologists look at Canadian Jewry as being a generation behind in terms of, de of development, of integration, assimilation, all the other things to their American cousins. Uh, when the Soviet Union died, we had large uh, numbers coming in. Uh, approximately during the 20th century, 25,000 Sephardic Jews from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, and Lebanon settled in Montreal. And that, you know, especially the French speaking uh, Jewish immigrants that has helped maintain the Jewish community in Montreal. Uh, because of the, in, in the 70s, uh, as a result of the Quebecois and other things, uh, Twenty to 30,000 Jews left Quebec. And uh, Toronto, uh, obviously, uh, got a, ma a majority of them. Now, I, I have two, uh, uh, as a 2021 census, uh, and the figures may be off a little bit because there's some discussion about how identification was made, but Canada's consists of 393,500 Jews which makes it the fourth largest Jewish community after those of Israel, United States, and France. 
Uh, if current trends and natural increase in net migration continue, Canada's Jewish population may exceed that of France within a decade. Uh, both countries have Jewish fertility rates below the replacement level in aging Jewish populations, but Canada's net migration is positive, while French is negative. All right, so uh, just to give you kind of a, a basic rundown, um, uh, a little bit of the history of where we are. All right. Uh, somebody said something in chat. Yeah, I rabbi finished school exams next week, back personally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Anything for tonight? Remembered everything I said tonight, right? <laughs> just, you know, uh, just a basic over here. I think a couple of elements, one element is very important to remember as Canadian Jews the fact that our country, to its shame, did not reach out to Jews fleeing the Nazis. That we have to take in again. Uh, and while it, recently uh, things have uh, changed somewhat in in some ways again, refugees in, it still is it, 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 it's still a stain on, on our history of Can Canadian Jewry. And uh, since I'm both American and Canadian citizenships, I can have shame from both countries. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, I will go over the calendar and send that out and get it all corrected. I apologize for, for uh, the changes that didn't get done properly. Okay, good night, everybody. Did you record tonight? Yes, I did. Okay. Awesome. Uh, stop recording.